Welcome everyone. This is a, um, another data set in our um, ongoing study of literacy and leadership, uh, looking at the open courses and comparing those to online courses. Um, I'm here with Autumn Keynes. Um, Autumn, this is an open data set as part of a research project and this, this data will, this video will be made available to everyone. Um, are you okay with me recording it and uh, releasing this video? Sure. Thanks. So, um, for those who don't know, uh, I, Autumn came up in many of the nodes, especially in RISO 15, I think. Those were, that's where we identified you. You were at the center of many different nodes uh, across different days. People were really connecting with you. I connected with you a lot. Um, we, we, talked, we talked about in, um, introverts. We talked about learning spaces. Um, what was your first involvement in kind of an open course? What was, how did you get involved in an open course? You mean any open course? Any, what, was your, yeah, what was your first one? Your MOOC I think experience. My first one was an ex MOOC, actually. Okay. And so it wasn't really, like, by nature, it wasn't an open course. I mean, like, RISO was my first really, like, just open CMOOC. Okay. That was the first time. So you're making this distinction between those ex MOOCs and the CMOOCs. What is that distinction that you're making for the audience? So I think of. X MOOCs as an expert-driven MOOC that is usually on a corporate platform mm -hmm. um, instead of uh, you know a community-based MOOC um, that may have a facilitator of types, but that facilitator isn't um, doesn't have like a you know like a corporate platform that they're running everything on. And, and Rizo was your first one. Yeah, Rizo was my first one. Now that's that being said, I. I when you first asked me, I said that my first open course was an XMOOC because um, I think it was maybe Kathy Davidson's okay. The Future of Higher Education. And even though she was considered the expert, I mean, you could say during RISO, Dave was considered mm -hmm. the expert, right? I mean, I, I would argue that the community was the expert, but um, but I guess you could. Somebody could say that Dave was, you know, because Dave's the facilitator, right? Yeah. Um, but Kathy was, like, the expert. Right, and she had this corporate platform. She was on Coursera, um, but there was uh, some folks who were doing stuff on Twitter, and some folks that were blogging, and some folks that were doing. Stuff so there was there's some that. leakage from the platform. So that's that's interesting, um, and this is I'm really looking at the leadership, and you really you took a, a, on a lot of leadership roles since the rise of 15. You're, are you you're involved in what it's. Uh, Virtually connecting, you've done. I've seen you be. You're, you're really. What? What? Now, how did that get started? Um. So, virtually connecting was sort of an outgrowth of Rizo, in the fact mm -hmm. that um, it. Well, yeah, it's interesting. You know, different people have different perspectives. I normally don't think of it that way until, like, I was talking with Helen DeWard the other day, and I asked her how virtually connecting got started. Mm -hmm. Um, and she said, oh, yeah, it got started at RISO, didn't it? And so it started about the same time as RISO, yeah. so it didn't, as far as time was concerned, they lined up with each other. Um, there was the conference, and this is actually, I wasn't involved in it this time. Yeah. So this is all hearsay, right? Mm -hmm. um, there was this conference, ET4 Buddy in Houston, or ET4 Online in Houston. It was the uh, online consortium people. Okay. And they, um, Maha couldn't go to the conference. Mm -hmm. Rebecca could go to the conference. And so Rebecca agreed to take Maha to the conference in a virtual way. And that's how it started. But you, and that's how it started. And you really took off in the leadership. And that's, that's where I'm looking at. When you think about that Kathy Davidson course, course and that, this idea that community is the expert and uh, rise over teen, I want to play with that much. How, where do you see the leadership in these? How do people become leaders? How did you end up being central to so many different nodes? Or do you consider yourself a leader? Yeah. Um, well, I guess I didn't necessarily realize I was central to a bunch of different nodes. I figured, I, you know, you never really know when you're yeah. in it. Like, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you see, the, you see the data graph afterward maybe over time, and you're like, oh, wait, I'm here, and I'm here, and I'm here. Um, I think that there's something to do with the platform, right? Okay. I think there's something to do with it being community-based and that being encouraged. Um, the fact that, it, at least in RISO, right, there, there was, I mean, you know, Dave put out one prompt a week. It wasn't like 
you got to read this book, you got to take this test, you got to publish mm -hmm. a blog post. There wasn't like a ton of requirements because we had that space, because we had that space, those of us that felt drawn to it and wanted to um, do more, I think that we ended up putting ourselves out there more. And, and I guess that's maybe what you're thinking of when you say, I don't know if I understand what you mean by leadership. I, I don't either. That's, that's what I'm okay. trying to get to understand. <laughs> um, because there is this element of, of there's this teaching, and I talk to, and I've talked to a lot of people across DS106 and Walk My World and Alrizo, and I'm trying to get at this, that there's this idea that in my mind that in these spaces, literacy, digital literacy is, in, is itself a form of leadership that, you know, you're helping other people. Like, what is one thing that you might, did you learn any, like, new skills or new knowledge? Oh, or so many. What, so many. A skill what? Skill-based in terms oh, of technology? Yeah. Oh, or? my God, so many. Can you pick Off one? In, in, oh, um, uh, in, in Rizo specifically? Or any of these places. Like, how do you learn any these skills? Any of these places. I mean, I mean, I... Yeah, I can give you so many. Um, so in Rizo, I'm thinking about all the art projects that we did. I really pushed myself in terms of sound editing. I hadn't done a lot of that, but um, um, who, you know, I remixed a oh, Sestina poem that we did. I'm sorry, what's that? No, so how did you learn to remix the audio? I learned uh, rhizomatically. <laughs> right? Yeah. Was, um, was there people you relied on, or were you Googling, or were you asking for help? Yeah, all of that. Oh, all that's of awesome. that, right? And I mean, a lot of it was like it was the fact that. So I feel like half the battle is having something to do, having mm -hmm. something that you're excited about that you want to contribute to, and then all of a sudden you're faced with all these problems. And I see the same thing in virtually connecting, right? Mm -hmm. I have a conference that I want to go to, but it's too far away, and I don't have the money, and I don't have the resources to get there. But I have a friend. Right. Yep. <laughs> and so, I mean, that becomes like a social kind of literacy almost, but then there's all these technological literacies too. So what if the, what if the, the conference doesn't have good Wi-Fi? Then I'm going to have to have some type of backup Wi-Fi device. Okay. Um, am I going to use Google Hangouts? What does that afford to me? What if I wanted to use Skype? What if I want other people to view it though? Right. What if I want to live stream it? There's, um, there's a lot of and things. You've, you've, and this has all grown so much. And, I'm interested in the study because I can't, that, I'm, you focused in on art, and that is a theme that just keeps coming back and back. That people don't see these, they see these as, these are art, artist communities, even though it was a, we are talking about like the study of learning, but DS106, yeah, that's, that, that's an art space. Seal Mook, everyone said, I'm there to make art. You just said, oh, it was really the art that drove me. Um, so that's, that's one of my key findings. I'm actually doing personas. Where I'm doing like UX personas as yes, my research method. That. Um, it's been fun, but the, but this idea of art is is really connecting with me in that in that sense. Um, so, what do you do as your day job? I am the associate director of academic technology at Capital University. And oh, okay. So now, and that's my like. I can't get I I I teach openly. I have all my kids blogging, but I can't recreate this magic. Uh -huh. That something about when I try to do the same kind of pedagogy with my students, it's yeah. just the, let me hand in my assignment and move on. So what is yeah. what's the difference? Why are why are there people still in Rizo when it ended last year, and there's still people so, tweeting at that hashtag? What's the difference between the classes that we have to teach and the classes that we want to take? So that's really interesting to me that you bring that up because I feel like that will just happen. We're having that conversation online right now. Um, let me find it. Hold on. I gotta find uh, Bonnie Stewart's most recent blog post. Have you seen her most recent? No, blog but I have, post? it's now data piece. <laughs> I will go find it. Yeah. So Bonnie just wrote this whole blog post. It's, she calls it, and she brings in, gosh, you know, like current politics that we're dealing with, all of these things. And, and Brian Alexander's doing this book group with a bunch of people. We make the road by walking. So they're reading this this book together. And so, Bonnie, it's kind of a book reflection. It's kind of a history lesson. The name of the blog post is Temporarily Embarrassed Millionaires. And... Um, she talks in here about the possibility of, of creating kind of like an educational community 
based on a historical movement, the Antigosh. I don't know how to say. I, it. I can't wait uh, to read the post. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to read the post, but I'm going to go to the to the um, to the comments. Okay. So Martin Weller says, uh, "Hi, Bond. Thanks for this. I've been thinking about this a lot, and I didn't know the Antigonish movement. Um, I keep coming up against a problem, though, which is that all of all of education implies a willingness to learn." There is a cultural movement in the UK and the US particularly, but elsewhere too, which portrays experts, knowledge, and education as a part of a conspiracy. Ignorance is more desirable than knowledge. We can deal with issues about access, opportunity, etc. But how do we overcome the anti-learning the anti-learning perspective? You can even get in the room, can't even get in the room then. I think that there may be tactics, although uh, so any thoughts that you have here would help me. And then I responded, this is why we need the artists, right? Mm -hmm. So there's something about inspiration, right? There's something about that spark um, that, oh, that the educator needs. The educator needs to be an artist. The educator needs to inspire. The educator needs to, um, to, to get students to the point where they have that willingness to learn, where they have that curiosity, where they're searching for, um, you know, those those answers as well, and help them, and guide them. But but I think it is a better educator who will inspire students to look for answers than some uh, an educator that will just give students answers. And that's and that's that's interesting. Um, so I, I can't wait to read that post because yeah, that that sums it up perfectly. Like, I'm, I'm thinking of like all the quotes that I'm going to use just from, from this talk alone, from meeting with you. Um, the other issue is that I find is we are a small group. Like there's, um, it's, we're, I, I'm stealing the digital nomads work that, uh, you know, that Rose did earlier. But we are about, it's the same core, like 15, 20 people that are bouncing from these courses to courses. Like, so mm -hmm. are, are we exclusive or inclusive in that sense? Or can we, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm thinking about Kevin and, and you and Ma. Like every there's a you'll hop and seal MOOC. You'll do Rizo. You'll do the the, the human MOOC, the uh, MOOC MOOC, which is the okay. the MOOC on MOOCs. <laughs> all these. Right. Wh why why do we keep all? What is our tribe? Well, who are we? What is this tribe that we've kind of made? So I see it as much more broad than that. Mm -hmm. I actually don't see it as just um, 15, 20 people that jump around. I do see a lot of the same faces, um, but I see a lot of new faces, oh, good, too. Good. Um, and I think that might be because of virtually connecting, mm -hmm. because I have such a strong role in virtually connecting and because I do so much in virtually connecting. Um, and if you go to the virtually connecting manifesto, we actually have a manifesto item that talks about inclusivity and recognizes the problem with inclusivity. So... This gets back to actually Dave Cormier, not in Wiseau, right? But he has a blog post. Um, every every we makes a them. Oh, and so how do you? There, inclusivity is a paradox, yeah. <laughs> right? As soon as you start saying, "Oh, we accept everyone," like it's it, it's trouble though. It's it's tricky. It, you can't really say that, right? And so you asked me what I do. One of the other things I did was um, this year I taught for the first time, and I taught a digital citizenship class, right? And mm -hmm. so I specifically called it that because I do think that that inclusivity thing, that idea of citizenship, that idea of belonging, is at the heart of a lot of these kind of things. Um, you have to be explicit about it if you're going to be um, inclusive and you're still gonna you're still gonna make people mad you're still not you're never gonna be able to get everybody you're never gonna be able to be completely inclusive yeah. um, of everyone there are so many natural barriers so I talk about a thing called the interpersonal multitudes barrier oh, interesting. which What's is that? this idea of um, and I mean it's basic communications right if you and I are having a very intimate conversation right now mm -hmm. because there's only two of us if we added another person, especially a person neither one of us knew, the intimacy of the conversation would kind of take a dip. Oh, right? yeah. If we were live streaming right now, the intimacy would take a dip. The fact that you're recording. The fact right? that this is a data set. Yeah, it's like. Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. So as soon as you start adding another agent, as soon as you start adding another um, entity, another another 
another ear, basically, right? As soon as there's somebody else that's listening or a technological device that's listening, the intimacy of that conversation starts to go down. And that's a natural barrier, right? Okay. That's not something that I think technology can fix. That's not, I think that's something that we need to be aware of and we need to be able to shift that and, um, and, and play with that depending on the different, um, the, the different environments that we're going to be in. And, and there's I, tons of these kind of barriers, right? There's language barriers. There's money. Money is a huge barrier. I mean, there's, there's tons of these natural barriers that we, we can't really overcome. I'll be with you in one second. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. That, I think we're going to end on the barriers there. I said it would take about 15 minutes of your time. Um, for those who don't know in the audience, uh, Virtually Connecting is an awesome system where people, uh, there's an on-the-ground buddy at a conference, and then they team up with somebody, not the conference, and there's video. After each keynote, there's a, a, a group hangout, and Autumn is central to that. She's been one of my inspirations, so I want to thank you for, for setting that up and all the work that you do, Autumn. Thanks for this conversation. You, it was it was brilliant. So thanks so much. Um, I'm going to upload this to YouTube and send it to Vialogs. And I'm coding all the data right on Vialogs. So you're welcome to join in and code your own data or just watch it as it unfolds. So thank you so much, Autumn. Um, I'm excited for your project. No, it's, it's been a fun project. I'm, I'm going to keep it going. It, it's Sarah and I have been working on it, but it was hard to, when you're, I've never done anything with rhizome analysis. And, and you, you realize very early that there is no way to do it. You just have to let those lines of flights develop. And it's been a fun kind of, kind of project. So um, thank you so much for being part of it. And thanks for all you do for everybody. Bye. I'm stopping the recording.